how many people here haven't started their first time? It wasn't intended to be that professional. After, um, so whatever questions you guys have, I'll prioritize based on whoever's stuck on part A. Okay. So today we'll be switching gears now. We did a lot of parameter estimation and we'll be focusing on some more Sort of, okay, so good. So we'll, the idea is again, we won't get into a lot of the math, but we'll get into sort of what the intuition of tunnel loops is, where they come up in fact with the kinds of systems that biomedical engineers see. That. So basics of the math, Basically, mostly the intuition of it. So the first problem that we talked about, extra office hours, I may, might, might be holding some. I'll send out an email about this. Yeah, no worries. Um, then practice from, from lecture two. I know I've been carrying this word for a long time. Okay. Uh, we can quickly take a look at it. Uh, has anybody done it though? You have? Okay. So what did you think? There's a practice problem on open edX, which I covered in lecture two. So what did you think was the Yeah, the second, uh, let's see, I don't even. Okay, the second one is the right one. Yeah, but the question is why? So just to, so that everybody's on the same page, basically this was dealing, if you remember, we were talking about compartmental modeling. This was a one compartment model and I implemented it two ways. One was in which 4045 calls a function in which within the function, so for some period of time I have an infusion of a drug and then I cut off the infusion of the drug, right? So, so basically in one case my differential equation is some input minus the elimination term and then in the second phase, my differential equation is just the elimination term. Now in MATLAB, I implemented this two ways. One was that within the function called by OD45, I write an if else statement saying that if the time is greater than the cutoff time, then just have this elimination term. If the time is less than that, then have the input term minus the elimination term. So those, the other way I implemented it was that I called OD45 twice, right? Right, one for, the uh, infusion stage, one for the cutoff stage, and then I concatenated the output. And it turns out you might think that the output in both cases should be the same, but as you can clearly see the output, there's this little hump that's created in the case where I use the if else statement. And the question really comes down to why that, does that hump come about? Okay. When you're trying to go in between. Okay, so yeah, so mathematically I think what is sort of what you're saying and the way to understand this mathematically is that all numerical integrators assume that your function is totally differentiable. Whereas at this point where you cut off the infusion, you lose differentiability because on one hand your differential equation is this, on the other hand your differential equation is that. And so it evaluates to different points and so that's why you get that little hump because sort of what Rohit was saying, that's what it comes down to. But it's because, so this very important point, that's why I kept coming back to it, is differentiability is an assumption made in all numerical integrators. That your functions are differentiable. Sometimes they won't be. And if they won't be, then you have to use sort of, you have to call OD45 many times, estimating wherever there are breaks, and then concatenate the output. Yes, you can, right? Because, so if you look at what I did here. Yes, as long as, as long as the point is, um, so you just have to be, I think that should work still. The only thing is that, the only thing that's different between the two, solver, so, two solvers practically is that the accuracy is different a little bit. So it shouldn't really matter because what you do in this case is you just pass out so the last value of y1, which is my 
the last value of the infusion phase becomes my initial value for the cutoff phase. So that should work irrespective of which solver is used. So something similar to the palm set where we have, yeah, okay. So we'll talk about that, but in the case of the palm set, I'll quickly mention this. Get rest. But uh, is that is that is that I have both equations within the function called by LSQ curve fit. So then, because LSQ curve fit gets all the parameters in, both equations use those four parameters, or a subset of those four parameters. So both of them are in the same function. LSQ curve fit doesn't call separate functions with each one equation. Sorry, does that make sense? I'll, I'll let's talk about it more after class. But you can use all parameters then. Okay, so, okay, so going, getting back to convolutions, so the first thing I want you to understand is this idea of a linear time invariant system. Uh, very important idea, and these are just definitions here. A linear system, and you can think of a linear system as even like a straight line is a linear system, mx plus c, where the input x is converted to the output y. y is equal to mx plus c, right? That's a linear system as well. So it's the terminology is, sounds a little bit formal, but you can think of it in your own ways. But a linear system, by definition, this is the one property that it satisfies. If you have alpha, beta constants and two time inputs, F1 and F2, a linear, you can basically, what it's saying is that the constant can be pushed out and the output of the constant times an input is equal to the constant times the output of the input, right? And also that you can basically, this. This is a principle of superposition, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with physics that, you know, you can sum two inputs together and the sum of the outputs of the individual inputs is equal to the output of the sum of the individual inputs. But, um, and then, so that's a linear system. A time invariant system is just something that doesn't change with time, right? That y is equal to mx plus c, the values of m and c don't change with time. So the output input relationship remains the same with time. So that's a linear time invariant system. And convolution is a hallmark of those systems. Why? The output of a linear time invariant system is just the convolution of the input and the impulse response of the system. And the impulse response, I'll be defining that later, um, but the impulse response, you can think of it as a property of the system, something that it always does, right? The y is equal to mx plus c, so m and c are the properties of that line, right? And so that's related to the impulse response of the system. But the reason I, I wrote this line earlier here is to suggest that's why convolutions are so important because you can predict the output of a system if you know this operation and you know the, imp uh, you know the input function that you're giving to the system and you know sort of the properties of the system. Convolution is the operation that you use to get to the output. That's why it's an important operation, okay? And I'm gonna talk just briefly about the math. I don't know, you, did you guys cover this in differential equations a little bit? I guess when you were doing Laplace transforms, this may have come up a little bit. But anyway, so convolution is defined by this integral. So if you're talking about the convolution of two functions, f and g, that's just this integral, and I'm just writing this here. We'll be gaining an intuition of all this math very soon. Um, and so it's an integral from minus infinity to infinity. One of the functions you just take as is, the other one you flip along the y-axis and then you shift it, and I'll be showing examples of this, and then in biomedical systems, usually our domain is zero to infinity, which means that f and g are zero everywhere else. So you can shift this, bump up this lower limit to zero, and t minus, because of the t minus infinity term, the upper limit goes to t. All this is theory. Um, you, I think, yeah, question. So let me get to the example instead of the matter thing. That's the one that makes it very, very clear as to what a convolution is. Come to the theory later. Okay, so, so now let's talk about a system where you're giving multiple boluses of drug to a person, right? This is an example. So you're giving a bolus of a drug, say five times I, in this case, I give a bolus of a drug. And what happens to any bolus of a drug? There's an ex exponential decay. In this case, I assume my time constant's one. So the exponential decay is e to the bar minus t. So that's the decay that happens in blood, right? Irrespective of how much of a bolus you give, right? And now the question I ask is, I'm giving the bolus at a certain frequency. So what is the plasma concentration at any point of that drug? That's the question I'm asking. That's the output, right? The input is just my regimen, my schedule at which I give boluses. There's not just one bolus, there are multiple boluses involved here, right? The system impulse response is related to this exponential decay. Every time I give a bolus, I see this exponential decay. But 
but the output you can imagine would be some sort of sum of all these exponential decays from a lot of boluses, and that's the convolution. So let's, let's see that in animation form here. So, so now what you're seeing here is so on the top, right, is my, are my boluses, okay? These are the boluses I've given. This red line is supposed to mark the exponential decay happening, right? And what the convolution is doing is I flip this, that, that was the T minus tau sign, I flip my impulse response and I slide it along my bolus regimen. And every time I'm sliding it, I'm generating my output. And so you can imagine, so here you have contributions from this bolus as well as that bolus, right? And the, you can imagine this reverse operation is important because when you're at this time point, the contribution of this bolus to that time point is approximately this, this on the red line, right? So that's why the sliding becomes important because this bolus contributes the maximum of the exponential, right? Because you're looking at that time point and that this bolus would be contributing about this much. So that's why you slide, that's why you flip the impulse response and then you slide it across. By the way, it's the same operation, even you can flip the input and slide it across the impulse response. That doesn't matter. And that happens because of a change of variables, which I'll show, but it doesn't matter, it's symmetric, the convolution. Um, but does this make sense to everybody? And that, that's the fundamental of the convolution operation. You, you flip one, let's look back at the math quickly and I'll replay this animation. So again, this T minus, tau, so F in that case was my bolus regimen was my impulse response. I flipped it and then I'm just sliding it, which means multiple values of f and g, multiple values of them, go into making one value of h. Because this one value of h, one value of h comes as an integral. So you're having multiple time points, which makes sense, right? In the case of your plasma concentration of a drug, all the boluses that have gone previously, right, the system has memory, all the boluses that have gone previously contribute to the plasma concentration that you see at some time point in the system, right? Because all of them, because those boluses might be still lasting to some degree, and that degree is defined by the exponential decay term, right? Does this make sense to everybody? And I'll show you, convolutions come up everywhere. Then once you start thinking like this, everything that you've seen about differential equations, everything just becomes a convolution. So I was mentioning that instead of sliding the impulse response or the system property, that exponential is the system property here across the input, we could also flip the input and slide that across the impulse response. And that, and that will be written in math just like this, right? You're just changing everything. And you can just verify this for yourself. You just do a simple variable substitution and these two integrals become equal. So it, convolution is a commutative property. Now Everett, does that answer your question? Are you you're combining two of your functions, it's a linear combination. So in, in the discrete world, you'll write something like this. It's just literally, so I flipped my impulse, I placed it along with my input, right? And at each value that I'm evaluating, I'm just taking the sum of the products of the function values at each time point, and that's called the convolution. No, 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 F is my, in that example, F is my bolus regimen, my entire bolus schedule. So the entire blue function is F. And G is my impulse response. So G is, so yes, so what is the impulse response? Okay, so let me define at this point. It's the characteristic decay. So if I was to give the system a unit impulse, that it, the output of the system is the impulse response by definition. Unit impulse is just um, a bolus of one unit in this case. It's just an input with one as the magnitude in a discrete case. In the case, in the, in the case where you're, in this case we're doing it as a discrete problem, in the case where you're working with continuous functions, that impulse becomes the Dirac delta function. I don't know if you've talked about this. It's the function that, whose integral is one when you integrate from minus infinity to infinity, but its value is zero everywhere else apart from zero. You can look it up. It's called the Dirac delta function. And so that's the impulse. Um, so, so, but again, what I want you to understand intuitively is that the impulse response of a system is sort of the property of the system, the defining hallmark feature of the system, right? How is it going to behave when I'm giving it a unit impulse? 
How is it going to behave? That's the idea behind the impulse response. And I'm gonna talk about an interesting property of impulses in general after this, but I'm gonna replay the animation so that you can convince yourself that this is how convolutions work. So again, look very carefully at how summations are happening here. Yes. There are five different boluses, and the output in this case is my plasma concentration of the drug, for example, right? And the exponential de describes what would happen to the drug in plasma if I just gave a unit bolus, if I give one unit of bolus. That's the idea of the exponential. So you see how here, at this time point, both of these will be contributing to some degree. Here again, both of these would be contributing. One way to convince yourself is that the, so that, that input bolus was 10, but the thing is that the out, this output goes slightly above 10. So you'll see even more variation. I can increase the frequency of this slightly, so I can just do. So I've, So now I've increased the frequency of those boluses so that you can see the summation perhaps a little bit even better. So you start off with some bolus, and now you'll see even more contributions happening. So that was an input of 10, and you see how here the bolus was an input of 10, but the plasma concentration spikes a lot more above 10 because you have residual contributions of this bolus and so on. And that's just the convolution. at the time, right, and so that's exactly what the math is too, right? So, but you're still speaking of a discrete case. So in the discrete case, ultimately you are doing a computation in your head as well, right? Um, the problem becomes that when you have to do a continuous case, you can only solve so many integrals. That's why it becomes useful to do stuff computationally because you can only solve so many integrals. So the yellow window in that case, I think, so I mean the whole point is that, again, the yellow window you can think of in this specific case is sort of the time interval over which the different values of f and g of my input on my impulse response are contributing to my convolution, one value of the convolution. So that's what I was saying, that multiple values of f and g are contributing, because you remember it's an integral, or in the discrete version, it's a sum of products. You're summing many, many different products within this interval. So that's the whole, that's very important to understand that multiple values of your input and of your impulse response go into making one value of the output. Right? Yeah. So the G function is just here. I plotted that here too. But then for the convolution, as I mentioned, you have to flip it along the Y axis and then you slide it across. So that's what was being slid across here. Yes, that's the red line. I can replay it very quickly, uh, and then we should go on to another example where you'll again see this. That it's just being slid across. At each value, when it, whenever you have this yellow window, everything in that yellow window, there you're taking sums of products, and then you can plotting accordingly. That's the convolution of. It's actually in this case pretty much, in this case it's pretty much the entire sort of, G is defined on the interval zero to five here. Yeah. So in this case it's just zero to five because it's, by definition it's zero everywhere else. Uh, yes, okay. yes. So 
so you could write it, I think, so I should mention that this code, a lot of this animation code is just downloaded from the MATLAB file exchange. And that's something that you guys should also do whenever you are like, you know, there's no point writing things that are already written. Um, the MATLAB central file exchange, it's like a portal where people post useful things download them and use them. And so I modified it based on the examples that I'm gonna talk about today. But anyways, in this case, it's using the MATLAB conv operator, which um, we'll talk about a lot. We'll ultimately, we'll be doing image processing in the Fourier domain, in the Fourier transforms, and that's what I'm building up to. That's the last lecture of the So we'll slowly get there, but okay. So, but this is using the conv function. Right, so we did that. Okay, so again, I'm just presenting the discrete version. It's just, again, you can see it's a sum of products, right? And so now I wanna bring in the interesting case where we're not looking at bolus in fusion, uh, a bolus um, regimen, but rather what if I decide to give the infusion of a drug, right? So what if I, what if I set up my machine such that it's delivering drug at a constant rate what do people expect will happen? My, my impulse response to the system is the same. So my impulse response is still that exponential. The only thing that's changed is that blue function is now a straight line, horizontal line. Yes, exactly. So if that's not a surprise, that's great. But I think pretty cool to just see this. So the blue again here, that's the infusion. So look at your output. The output just becomes an exponential. And so, um, I think this is pretty cool. But, uh, so, so, and that sort of makes sense if you just think about the convolution here, right? So after a certain time, you still have a constant <laughs> input, and so you're gonna be doing the same sum of products every single time, right? It's the same input, it's the same impulse response, it makes sense that you're gonna hit a steady state here. But this does suggest something very interesting, because, we usually get to such outputs using differential equations, right? We'll set up an ODE45 thing, and in the case of an infusion of a drug, that's what we would have done. That's sort of the lecture two example we were looking at, where, you're, where I would have said, I have a constant input, and then input minus the elimination term, where the elimination term is a first order rate constant defined term. And that's how I would have used ODE45 to solve that differential equation, and I would have received this result. In fact, the point is that for, and I'm not gonna go into the math of this, but for a linear system of differential equations, the general solution of any linear system, however many equations you have, is just a convolution. You can write it in terms of a convolution. So a linear system of differential equations, the solution is just a convolution. You can just write it in the equation. That's the power of convolution. So just wanted to talk about the infusion of a drug and tie it into differential equations because convolutions are important. Okay, so again, I hope that you've taken a, this point away so far, is that the convolution of the input function with the impulse response gives you the output. And the point is that the impulse response we talked about is the output when the input is an impulse. We talked about the Dirac delta versus the unit impulse for the continuous versus discrete case. And this is a very quick point here, I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but impulses also, so if I think of Instead of the impulse response being slid across here, think of just an impulse being slid across just any function. So that's still a convolution, I'm still sliding something across, right? If you slide an impulse across a function, what are you gonna get? A unit impulse, say in the discrete case, I slide a unit impulse across a function, what do I get? Just the function. And so it's called, it's actually, it's, it's a very useful property. It's called the sifting property of impulses. And so basically, the, and the idea is that the location of the impulse, right, when you're sliding it across, gives you the value of the function at that location, right? And just in animation form, that is something like, it just mathematically it becomes very useful when you're doing this. We might see a lot of that when, you might see some of that when we do the. Uh, 
Well, but you're getting to know the value. So think of it this way, that the integral of a delta at some point with the function f of something is equal to f of ti, oh. where I'm getting the value of the function back. It's a way for me to get the value of the function back, right? Again, so I'm sliding the delta function across, and I'm getting the value of the function back at every point. Every convolution is just giving me one value of the function at every point. So I'm basically sliding an impulse across this function, right? And the point is that, so in this window, right, location of the impulse, which is the red line here, it's now kind of spun beyond the bounds, but, um, the location tells me the value of the function at that point, right? Again, think of it as a discrete case as a sum of the products. The only thing that's gonna get multiplied is where that impulse is. Everything else is zero as far as the, the impulse is. There's only one value existing somewhere, and that value would be active, that value one would be active only at the point where the impulse is currently standing. And so the output would be just the value of the function at that point. So, that's called the sifting property. It's a very important property. Okay, so we've talked about the sliding nature of the convolution operation. Is there any, are there any questions about that? That's very important to understand. That is common. And we've also talked about that many values of M and G go into making one value of H, where H is minus one. So we've talked about, uh, you know, um, a little bit of formal kinetics. We've talked about bolus versus infusion. Where, are, where do you see convolutions otherwise? So, so say I put in, I have a capillary bed, for example, right in the body somewhere. Now each capillary between the in and the out, right, from like the, um, from literally from the arterial to the venial, right, there's a capillary bed in the middle, and the, the capillaries will each have sl slightly different lengths. Right? So if at the input I inject a dye, right, so you would expect the output to be sort of blurred, right? Because the dye is gonna travel through different lengths of the capillary bed, and then finally the product that you're gonna see is not just an impulse, but like sort of a, dis it's, called, it's called dispersion of the phenomena, right? The dye will sort of get dispersed because you will have ejection out of each capillary length at different, slightly different times because the length is different, the velocities might be different, so on and so forth. So that's called dispersion, right, again. So then you can imagine making an impulse response for this capillary bed, and any input that you give to the capillary bed is a convolution of that impulse response with the input that you give. You can model dispersion, for example, and the, a lot of the modeling, for example, of, um, of sort of circulatory system in terms of sort of the time it took for, um, the time it took for a certain, um, for blood to travel from one part of the body to the other was done by, for example, injecting dyes and like seeing what the waveform looked like Medical imaging, everywhere there's convolution involved because convolution is actually the fundamental of how Photoshop works. Every single image processing operation you do in some way or the other is a convolution. For the most part. Some that are not because they're not linear anymore. But for the most, and we'll be talking about this when we're doing image processing in the third unit. We'll be talking about how you can blur an image using convolution. We'll be talking about how you can sharpen an image using convolution. We'll be talking about all sorts of, you can define your favorite operations to do what you'll be doing to the image will be a convolution. So convolution is how you do image processing. It's the fundamental exist, like it's the fundamental backbone of image processing is convolution. Um, and so also you can think of you going to the lab today, you acquire some data, right? And the data has noise, right? And so that noise, for example, you can think of it as, so you, you the signal that you were getting should have been one number, but now you get different numbers corresponding to say a Gaussian distribution around the noise. You can think of that as a convolution because it's that one value being convolved by a Gaussian distribution which is defined by the mean and the standard deviation of whatever measurement instruments you're looking at. So I'm just trying to, con again, convolution of course holds only for linear time invariant systems. So you have to be careful when you can use it, right? But I'm saying that you can start seeing them in everywhere in the world around you. And, and there are a lot of tie-ins between a lot of things you've done in math so far. It's just a property of a linear system, really. Okay, so now uh, moving on to the last part, and this is sort of um, forward-looking to what's gonna come in unit three more, um, is 
so the convolution, this is a very important result. The convolution of two functions in the time domain, which is what we were doing, is equivalent to multiplication of their Laplace or their Fourier transform. And you guys have done Laplace transforms, by the way, right? You use the letter S in Laplace transforms. You, you just substitute that S with J omega. So S could be a complex number, say I plus J omega, right? If you just say, if you just replace, if you say that the real part of S is zero, you get all of Fourier transforms. That's it. Fourier transforms are just a simplification of Laplace transforms. So anyway, so that's why they're, they're treated very equivalently in most cases. So the point is that the convolution of two functions in the time domain is equivalent to multiplication of their Laplace transforms, which means, I'm not gonna go into the derivation here, you can look it up in your image. Very fundamental result. So you're doing a convolution, that's the same as, so the multiplication of the Laplace transforms, S here represents the Laplace transform, of F and G, the multiplication of that is just the Laplace transform of the convolved function, okay? H of S is equal to F of G S, okay? This is a very important property. And so just to go back to the drug infusion case, I know you don't, you may not remember the formula for the Laplace transforms, but the infusion, you have a step function, the Laplace transform of a step function is just one over S, my, my, my infusion was of the, uh, uh, was five, so the Laplace transform of that is five over S. The exponential for e to the bar at, the Laplace transform is one over S minus A. I was just using an impulse response of e to the bar minus T, so that becomes one over S plus one, right? So I, these were the two Laplace transforms, one for the input, one for my impulse response. If I take the product, I get this, I do a partial fraction decomposition, and then I take the inverse Laplace transform, I just get this, which is what you get from your differential equation. That also um, another thing was we t we always have seen with Laplace transforms. I don't know if you remember these tables; it, they used to annoy me so much. But e to the bar at used to be this, and then this weird-looking function used to be that, right? Right. Um, for the for the case, okay. So now if we Put n is equal to one, right, in this. The Laplace transform is just one over s minus a squared, which is just the product of these two things together, right? Which means that, um, which means that t to the bar e a t should just be the convolution of e a t with itself. Does everybody see that? So the, because you're seeing n is equal to one, you get one over s minus a squared, which is the product of these to taken together. That means the convolution of this with itself should just be t times e to the bar at. Let me just prove that down here, where you convolve e to the bar at, a tau, a, e to the bar at minus tau, which we just get over s. It's a very fun way uh, to look at a lot of things you've learned so far. And okay, so the, in this specific example, why would you want to take the convolution of an exponential with an exponential, right? And that's my final example for today. <coughs> okay, so say, so again, this is a result you may or may not know. So you, everybody knows Poisson processes, right? Memoryless processes. You know. No? Okay, so Poisson processes, um, so radioactive decay is a classic example of a Poisson process where, where where, where, so you have a certain amount of radioactive material, right? And that defines um, sort of how many, how many decay events you'll see in a given time interval. Poisson process is any memoryless process. You're standing at the traffic intersection. How many cars are gonna pass this traffic intersection at a given time of the day in a 10 minute time window? That's a Poisson process, okay? Any Poisson, it's fundamentally just a process where the occurrence of one event is independent of the previous event, you can think of it as the limit of, it. you can, a lot of the, the definition, um, sorry, the derivation of the Poisson probability distribution just comes from the binomial distribution as your n goes to infinity in the binomial distribution. If you're doing like infinity of these events, then you get the Poisson process out. You can look at that derivation on Wikipedia. But the intuition of that is just literally you're starting at a traffic intersection, the number of cars that pass by in 10 minutes is going to be that the mean for the mean for that 10 minute window statistical distribution is just half of the mean for the 20 minute distribution. Radioactive decay is a Poisson process, so on and so forth. 
But anyways, so in a Poisson process, between two occurrences of an event, the time delay that exists is defined by an exponential probability distribution. So when you have a Poisson probability distribution and there's an exponential probability distribution that defines, so what is the time delay? What is the probability distribution of the time delay between two cars passing the intersection in that exponential? That's given by an exponential probability distribution. And now, so you can think of it at the very molecular level, if there are Poisson processes everywhere in the, at the molecular level too. So say you're looking at like DNA replication, transcription, whatever, um, there are two enzymes involved, one after the other, both of them work in a Poisson way, they take some reagent, they take some substrate, do something to it, and say you're measuring something which comes as a result of two enzymes working one after the other. Both of them are Poisson, right? Sure, it's, I mean, it's, depend, it's dependent on the context. There are many scenarios where they are truly independent of each other, right? Um, in that, sure, they can be regulating each other, in which case it's not Poisson anymore, but there are many scenarios where they're two enzymes working one after the other. Like, a, it's like an assembly chain, like a, what is it called? Assembly line, yeah. So, yeah, so, and so, and so the, but the idea is that, so the exponential probability distribution defines the time delay between the occurrences of two Poisson, or two events, all, which are characterized by Poisson process. So now if you have two such processes involved in the creation of a product of interest, right, something that you're measuring, say, right, then basically the time delay between, uh, the probability distribution of the time delay between the synthesis of two different molecules will be given by the convolution of the exponential distribution describing each Poisson process. Does that make sense? So let's think of an example. So say I have, okay, so primase and polymerase, right? For example, DNA primase, that would lay down a primer, or RNA primase, would lay down a primer, right? And then polymerase will come along, right? And then DNA polymerase would elongate that primer, right? For example, so you can think of that as two different Poisson processes, right? Where the laying down of the primer is one Poisson process, the elongation of that is another Poisson process, and then say you're measuring the fragment that came out, right? So there's an exponential probability distribution associated with the time delay of the primase. There's another exponential probability distribution associated with the time delay of the polymerase. And then now you're looking at, so when both of them are in the system, right, and I'm measuring these fragments out, between the synthesis of two different fragments, what's the probability distribution of that time delay? That's just a convolution of those two exponential distributions. And so you get basically something like this out, right? And so if you get something, like, how does this make sense? So this function is just, it's, so you have an exponential, this function starts at zero, right, and goes up and then goes down, right? That's what t times e to the power a t looks like. And how does that make physical sense? Now, to get the synthesis of a fragment, if your time delay is zero, that's not possible. Two independent processes are happening here, so some time delay has to exist before you get any synthesis. In the case of an exponential distribution, the highest probability is at zero time because it's very likely that it'll happen right after. But when you have two multiple processes involved, you have zero probability of getting anything at simultaneously because, because, um, because two different processes have to take place. The likelihood that they'll take place at the same time is, in fact, it's impossible. That's why even, even something as simple as the convolution of two exponentials is very important. And then I've listed some MATLAB functions for convolution here, but I'll be coming back to this a lot more 